Hello, today I'm at Tamworth Castle in Staffordshire, one of the best preserved examples of a Mutton Bailey castle anywhere in the country. The Normans introduced this kind of castle when they came and conquered England in 1066. And what they did was create a large mound of earth or a mot upon which they placed a keep originally made out of wood and then eventually stone. And around the outside of the castle, you'd have had a bailey, a large enclosed area that was ringed by a wooden palisade wall. Castles like Tamworth would have dominated the local landscape and sent a very clear message to everybody that the Normans were now in charge. As well as being the residence of a local lord and an important administrative center, they were a vital way of maintaining control over the surrounding community. As building technology improved, the majority of Mott and Bailey castles were rebuilt in stone on a far grander scale, like here at Kenilworth in Warwickshire with its magnificent Norman keep. The history of Kenilworth in the 13th century offers us an insight into one of the most fascinating aspects of medieval castles. How these formidable buildings were attacked when the country descended into war. And it's on this site that back in 1266, Henry III began the longest siege in English medieval history. It lasted for 172 days. Now, Henry III was desperate to flush the rebels out of Kenilworth Castle, who gathered there and following the Battle of Evesham and the death of their leader, Simon de Montfort, the brother in law of the king. And Henry's challenge was to try and take the castle using a whole variety of different siege weapons. Now it was Henry III's dad, King John, who'd spent in today's money £800,000 strengthening the walls of Kenilworth Castle. The irony was the castle was now held by Henry III's enemies, the rebels. Now it was behind these walls in 1266 that the rebels had gathered to try and face down Henry III. Henry had tried to negotiate with them, he sent them a messenger but unfortunately the rebels weren't interested. So they got the messenger, chopped his hand off and sent him back to Henry III. This was the final straw for Henry, who decided after this point to launch a siege against the rebels. Henry's main problem in capturing Kenilworth was that it was surrounded by a mere or lake, a defensive measure designed to prevent its walls from being undermined. A favoured tactic by those laying siege to a castle was to dig a tunnel beneath one of its walls or towers that would then be filled with flammable material, such as animal fat. When this material was ignited, the wooden supports holding up the tunnel would collapse, causing part of the castle wall to fall down. Henry's only option was to rely upon a siege weapon known as a counterweight trebuchet, an enormous catapult so called as it used a counterweight to swing an arm that hurled a projectile at the enemy. The War Wolf, the largest trebuchet ever made, was built by Edward I and used at the Siege of Stirling Castle. These remarkable machines, pictured here firing across the mere into Kenilworth, would no doubt have struck fear into the hearts of the rebels. Even today, it is still possible to see a life-size trebuchet in action and to appreciate its devastating capabilities. I'm here at Warwick Castle, the home of the largest trebuchet anywhere in the world. Built back in 2005, it was based on designs from the 13th and 14th centuries and would look very similar to the kind of trebuchets used at the Siege of Kenilworth. Now these trebuchets weren't just designed to fire large stone projectiles that could knock down castle walls, they'd also fire projectiles that could be set on fire to cause a fire inside the castle walls where most of the buildings were made out of timber. They could also fire rotting animal carcasses that would shatter on impact with the ground, spreading illness and disease amongst the castle inhabitants, forcing them to surrender. If a member of the castle community was ever captured, their bodies could be mutilated, the body parts loaded into the trebuchet and fired back into the castle as a stark warning for the fate that was awaiting anybody who refused to surrender to the besiegers. Seeing a replica of the weapon loaded and fired really does give you a sense of its enormous scale and potential when used against a medieval castle. 
One has to remember that the men who operated these fearsome machines would have been under constant bombardment from the arrows and missiles of the enemy who would go to any lengths to prevent it from being fired. Despite the might and power of the trebuchet, it was disease and starvation that ended the siege. On the 13th of December, what was left of the garrison at Kenilworth finally surrendered.